Thank you all for coming. I'm Ginny Sawyer. I actually work for the city of Fort Collins, but I'm moderating these fire forums. And I'm learning a lot in the process. Um, I'd like, how many people were at the first one? Three or four weeks ago? Excellent. Um, if you were not able to attend that and you're interested in seeing that, you can find it online um, on the little flyer that lists out all the forums. There's a website at the bottom. Um, so it's on the museum website, and that's listed there. I think it's also on the City of Fort Collins YouTube site if you want to look there. Um, and that program focused very much on <clears throat> the actual firefighting. So tonight we're doing um, some stuff on land use, and we have a great panel here. You can see who they are and read, and I'll let them introduce themselves as they speak. Um, <clears throat> we'll do this similar to last time. For those who weren't here, we try to keep this fairly interactive. Um, we're going to get some good background context information from each of our panelists, um, and they can dialogue amongst themselves. As we have questions from you, because we're recording it, uh, the microphone is important. So if it's an easy question and you can write it on your little three by five card and pass it to the end of your row, we'll grab them and read them and answer. Um, if you really wanna ask a question, I can run the microphone and get it to you and do that. So we're pretty flexible in our format. <clears throat> uh, and so with that, um, <clears throat> So as you see, we're going we're gonna to start with Lori, who's going to give us actually a lot of background. Um, I was surprised by the timeline, but I'm not a scientist. Uh, yeah, so she's going to kick off and sort of do the, over the past 1,000 years, how have our forests changed? What's gotten us to where we are here today? And so, um, Lori, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, give us some history. This is the most high-tech place I've ever been. <laughs> so um, I'm Laurie Huckabee. I work for the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station. Not everybody knows it, but in addition to managing our public lands, the Forest Service does have a very active and well-respected research program, and I'm lucky enough to be a part of that. My specialty is the science of dendrochronology, which is using tree rings, um, how trees grow, to date events in the past and I've worked all over uh, Wyoming, New Mexico, but mostly in Colorado and the last 10 years my research has been focused here in Larimer County and Larimer County is a really pretty interesting place. So trees are great recorders of history. They're fantastic storytellers. You just have to learn their language to understand what they're telling you. So the way the science of dendrochronology works is that in temperate regions, trees put on one ring of wood growth every year. The size of that growth is regulated by genetics of the trees, but more importantly, by limiting factors in their environment. And in northern Colorado, the most limiting factor is generally water availability. So pretty much you get a narrow ring, it's a dry year, you get a wide ring, it's a less dry year, it's always dry. Um, and so we can match the patterns of ring width back in time and we can accurately date events that the trees react to. So if a tree is scarred by fire, if climate changes, if someone chops a hole in the bark, we can date that. Not just within plus or minus 30 or 40 years like you can with um, carbon dating, but actually to the calendar date and sometimes to the the season of the year that it happened. We happen to have some very old living trees in Larimer County. I know of six or seven of them that are over 700 years old, one that's 800 years old. I'm not going to tell you where it is though. <laughs> and it's a Douglas fir. The others are ponderosa pines. Um, but then using dead wood, whose ring signatures overlap the living ones, we've been able to push our chronology back for a thousand years. So next slide, please. So if you cut the front range, particularly the northern front range uh, in 
a cross section, you'd get this elevational range here from about 5,000 feet, like we have down where we are right here in Fort Collins at the edge of the short grass steppe, all the way up to about 11,500 feet, which is upper tree line. And then of course we go on up to 14,000 plus on the tops of the mountains. As you go up in elevation, you get changes in moisture availability, timing of moisture and the vegetation if you were to if you were to try to replicate this um, without the elevational gradient you'd be doing if effectively going driving from like the plains in texas all the way up to the arctic circle that would be the distance you'd have to go to experience these same uh, changes in vegetation with climate we're lucky enough to have that compressed into an elevational gradient that's a little less than 100 miles long. So you start here in Fort Collins and you drive up to Trail Ridge Road, for example, and you've driven through this entire climatic gradient, we call it, where things change with elevation and the vegetation changes too. So I've got some animations here. If you do the next advance, so there's, this is in Laurie State Park. This is what we call the shrubland woodland. It's where the short grass steppe is coming together with the shrubland that, that's kind of the ecological equivalent of chaparral in California. It's uh, fire adapted shrubs and then really scattered ponderosa pines. So um, this is what we call the lower montane. You go up just a little bit higher from about 6,000 feet to about 7,500 feet. It's not what you'd think of generally as closed forest, but it's ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, a little bit of juniper mixed in. Then you get into the upper montane, which we also call the mixed conifer zone, where you still have ponderosa pine and Douglas fir, a little bit of juniper. You still got components from the lower montane, but you're also beginning to get components from the upper, uh, from uh, the subalpine and the upper montane. So you start picking up lodgepole pine, a little bit of spruce, blue spruce and Engelmann spruce. And then next slide. You go up a little higher. Uh, above about 9,000 feet, you get into what we call the subalpine, where um, mostly you've lost ponderosa pine, mostly you've lost Douglas fir. Now the dominant pine is lodgepole, and you have uh, Engelmann spruce, subalpine fir, a little bit of limber pine. Above 9,000 feet, for the last several hundred years at least, is that's kind of the limit of our winter snowpack. So water. Uh, is less important there because as, as you have snow all winter long, it accumulates, it sits there, and then it melts out over the course of the summer. So unless you have a really, really light snowpack, which does happen occasionally, these forests tend to be pretty wet and they're less limited by water than they are by the length of the growing season because it's colder up there. And then finally, about 11,500 feet, depending on your aspect and where you are, the season is too short, trees can't grow at all, and you're in the alpine. Now, as you get these changes with elevation in forest type, you also get changes in what we call the fire regime. So, so keep an eye on this, this middle part. The high park fire um, burned basically from the short grass steppe, from right around Bellevue, all the way up to kind of the lower end of the subalpine. So it covered a really large portion of this entire elevational gradient. So we've got the same elevational gradient. So now we want to look at what fire regimes we have along the elevational gradient. So when I say fire regime, a fire regime is the pattern over time of the frequency and intensity of fire. So every individual fire event is unique, driven by weather, topography, how it was ignited, just every little thing you can imagine goes into it to make it a unique event. But over time, certain vegetation types within certain elevation ranges tend to have the similar sorts of fires that have similar sorts of ecological effects. So the, the lower montane and the, uh, the woodland, where it's really generally pretty open, you have a lot of grass understories, that's where you get surface fire. Um, surface fire will tend to burn along the ground. It doesn't usually kill mature trees. It may kill seedlings and small trees, but it's what we think of as a grass fire or a brush fire. 
So that tended to happen historically before humans started changing things relatively frequently on the order of maybe every 7 to 15 years, depending on when droughts were, because it was very drought-driven. Um, in some places, humans ignited more fires than in other places, so you might get more frequent fire. But every 7 to 15 years or so, in these open grassy stands, you'd get a surface fire that didn't kill most of the overstory trees. So we call this kind of the, the Goldilocks effect. <laughs> the, in the middle elevations, you get the middle sort of fire, which is what we call mixed severity fire. It's where you get mostly surface fire still, but it's a little bit wetter up there, a little bit cooler, so it takes a more extreme drought to get the fire going. So it's not as frequent. It's maybe on average every 30 to 60 years. And sometimes during severe droughts, or if the wind picks up, you've got enough fuel there to do what we call a stand replacing fire in patches. So mixed severity fire means that any given fire event may have part of it that burns along the surface, just kills the grass and the shrubs and the little trees, doesn't kill the big trees, but then other places it flares up and it does kill some of the mature trees. And finally, when you get up into the, those higher elevations where it's generally wetter, it's generally cooler, it takes a really, really dry year for the fuels to dry out enough to burn. But when they do, there's plenty of fuel there. And then you get what we call a stand replacing fire. And that's normal for higher elevations. Above 8,500 feet or so, stand replacing fire is normal. But it happened on a much longer time scale. So say every 100 to 300 years. So a longer time scale, uh, if you want to see the effects of a fire that, that was a stand replacing fire, or at least mostly, go up to the Pingree Park campus of CSU in 1994. There was a fire up there. It was ignited by lightning in July, and it was stand replacing, and it's now opened up that, that country. We got lots of aspen um, regeneration, mostly from sprouts, lots of lodgepole pine regeneration that was an absolutely normal fire for that type of forest. And so, so the High Park fire burned along this whole elevational gradient and it burned with all of those different intensities at different times and in different places. Um, it burned very hot, very intense, took out all of the trees during the times when the weather was really conducive to that, when the wind was blowing, when it was really, really dry. And what was kind of unusual about that was that there was stand replacing fire in the lower elevation forest. So we will all talk about that a little bit more later, but just bear that in mind that the most intense stand replacing fire actually occurred at the lower elevations, which is kind of contrary to the historical fire regimes. So Pretty much all the native vegetation in northern Colorado is adapted to fire one way or another. Um, ponderosa pine is kind of the classic tree that's adapted to surface fire. It tends to get big fairly quickly. It likes to be out in the open. It doesn't like competition. It gets really nice thick bark. So after the tree is bigger than, oh, say an inch or so in diameter, and it's just a little bit taller than the grass, it can survive surface fires. I've got 500 year old logs with multiple scars from fires on them and this the first fire scar happened when the tree was maybe an inch in diameter which tells you that the fire number one the tree is well adapted to fire but number two the fire was burning through grass it was really flashy fuel it passed by really quickly and it didn't catch the little seedling on fire so one of ponderosa pines are some of our best storytellers in terms of preserving that that history of fire because oftentimes they will get scorched on one side and it will create a scar that we can then date in the ring sequence that's how we know what these fire regimes were historically is that the trees are recording the dates of the fire and their growth our fire histories are probably really on the conservative side especially in the lower elevations because a lot of those fires burned really quickly through grass and the trees may not even have registered a scar but the fires that did register scars we can date those and that's actually the most fun thing that i do uh, the other thing that ponderosa pine tends to do is that it, it self prunes. So it's not tolerant of shade at all. It's not even tolerant of its own shade. So it'll stop, start dropping branches off when they start getting shaded. And that has the additional effect of protecting them from having fire get up in their crowns. Now, the reason that's significant 
for fires like High Park is that it had been a long, long time since there had been fire in a lot of the lower elevation stands that burned in the High Park. And so there were a lot of tall shrubs. There were a lot of young trees. There were a lot of things that could catch fire and then take the fire up into the crowns of the Ponderosa Pines. And even though they're well adapted to surface fire, they really aren't so good with crown fire. Um, other vegetation in that elevation range that's well adapted to fire, almost all of the native bunch grasses have their buds down inside of the plant. And so the above ground, you know, the, the grass blades will burn off, but the buds are down inside of there. And within a few days, sometimes of the fire, they'll start to sprout. Mountain mahogany, which is the common shrub at that elevation, also will sprout within days to weeks of a fire even if it doesn't get any water so all of the vegetation below 7500 feet is really well adapted to surface fire so let's go to the next slide when you get up above about 8500 9000 feet those plants are pretty well adapted to stand replacing fire lodgepole pine has a lot of it does not every single tree has it but um, they can have what we call serotonous cones. They're co seed cones that are sealed shut with resin and a fire will go through, it'll burn through the crowns of the trees and it will melt the resin that's holding that cone shut. But the cone scales are actually a little bit damp and so it takes a couple of hours for them to dry out and as they dry out, they kind of spread out. By that time, the ground is all cooled off, all the understory is removed and the seeds just come raining down. And so after you get a stand replacing fire in lodgepole, if it has serotonous cones at all, which most of ours do, you'll get a tremendous seed fall and oftentimes a huge number of trees, sometimes as many as 10,000 seedlings per acre will establish. They're not all gonna survive, but you get almost instantaneous regeneration. Now it takes them a while to, to grow very tall, but that's why lodgepole tends to be pretty dense. You know, you'll see what we call dog hair lodgepole, lots and lots of stems. Um, aspen is also that way. In fact, aspen doesn't really like to compete with other trees for light either. So it kind of likes to burn off every 100 to 200 years. And then it will sprout immediately from the roots and oftentimes take over and dominate the forest for the first 100 years or so after fire. And then the conifers catch up and it will become a conifer forest. So the longer you go without a stand replacing fire, especially at higher elevations, the less aspen you're gonna have. One of the things we're gonna see a lot of after the High Park fire and after the bark beetle outbreak is probably a lot more aspen. So I showed you the elevational gradient. I showed you how the, um, the vegetation and the fire regime sort out along that elevational gradient. It hasn't always been that way and it probably all, won't always be that way. Uh, because we have this thousand year chronology, we've been able to piece together what the forests were like at different periods of time over that thousand years. So the first part of the last thousand years, in fact, from about 800 AD to a little after 1300 AD was what we call the medieval warm period. It was a period of time that was on average about three degrees centigrade warmer than the 20th century. And in many parts of the country, particularly our part of the country, very, very dry. There were some droughts, especially the second half of the 1100s, the last 25 years of the 1200s that were 60, 30 to 60 years long and they made the 30s drought look like a walk in the park. We're talking, uh, it was so dry that the, the sand hills in Nebraska and along the South Platte were active sand dunes, like you'd see at Great Sand Dunes National Park. They, they supported no vegetation and they were actively moving around. During that period of time, it looks like lower tree line, which now comes down all the way to 5,000 feet at the base of the foothills, was maybe at around 8,000 feet, and it was ponderosa pine. We've found um, old dead logs, very old dead logs, of ponderosa pine at 10,700 feet, which is about 1,000 feet higher than the highest ones occur now. So clearly during that, that warmer period of time, the whole elevational gradient of vegetation was shifted up in elevation. The medieval warm period obviously didn't last forever, even though that was what did in the classic Maya civilization. They were all, 
you know, tuned into having more water. The droughts of the medieval warm period hit them and their whole civilization collapsed. It also enabled the Vikings to settle and actually do farming in Greenland. But then they got kind of a rude awakening about the mid-1300s because the climate changed again. We don't know for sure why. Uh, There's been some speculation that it might have had to do with even the amount of energy output from the sun. But regardless, starting about the mid-1300s, things started getting cooler, significantly cooler. There were also a couple of big uh, volcanic eruptions in 1316 and I'm going to say 1323 that put up big dust veils, and that may have hastened the effect. But that big climate change in the middle of the 1300s was actually part of what precipitated the Black Death that got to England in 1348. Around here, what happened was it was actually pretty good for the trees. Uh, It got cooler, it got wetter, and trees began to move down that elevational gradient. So by the middle of the medieval warm period, uh, which is a time what that's called the Maunder Minimum, it was actually a period of minimum solar output in the mid-1600s. Um, trees had started marching down slope, and they were establishing pretty rapidly, so that lower tree line was getting down to about 6,500, 7,000 feet. And that went on. It was cooler off and on wetter and drier. Um, Some of the biggest droughts that we know of, the 1580s mega drought, continent-wide drought, was during the medieval, or I mean the uh, Little Ice Age, but it was still cold. Um, And then it was punctuated by periods that were also wet. But along about the same time that Euro-Americans started settling this part of the country, the mid-1800s, the Little Ice Age came to an abrupt end. Again, we're not entirely sure why. Around here, it actually seemed to have started rather abruptly in 1842. I have some colleagues that did a drought reconstruction, and there was a very intense, very localized drought in northern Colorado from about 1842 to about 1863. Well, that just happens to coincide with the time that Euro-Americans were starting to come here in large numbers. So, Trees by that time had moved down almost to as far as they are now, Um, not quite. The 20th century was actually a great time to be a tree around here because it was relatively warm, relatively wet, the 30s and 50s droughts notwithstanding, and humans had started putting out fires. So we had a tremendous amount of tree establishment in the last hundred years that probably would not have happened historically because it was a longer period of time, especially at those lower elevations, without fire. And in addition to the the change in climate, we had people that were grazing tremendous numbers of cattle, which eliminated the surface fuels, prevented the spread of surface fires. Um, Cattle also tend to churn up the soil, which makes a better seed bed for trees. So there were a lot of things conspiring to cause a lot of tree regeneration in the 20th century. So my last slide, and then I will happily cede to my friend Boyd. (laughs) Uh, So I and my colleagues have a lot of places that we've done research all around Larimer County. This is one of them in the upper part of Young's Gulch, and we literally sampled this site about three weeks before the High Park fire. And you can see, this is uh, about 7,000 feet elevation. It's almost entirely ponderosa pine, which normally, historically, tended to be really open, grassy understory. Well, there's not a lot of that going on. You're seeing a lot of young trees relatively close together. Um, There is some grass on the ground, but there's patches where it's just needle litter. Needle litter tends to burn really, really hot. That's what it looked like three weeks later. High Park roared through there and just took out everything. It burned with an intensity that was very unusual uh, historically. So uh, with that said, I will turn it over to Boyd and if you have any questions, we can do that too. Yeah, if people do have questions again, um, please write them on your cards and just send them to the end and then hold them up and Sue can grab them. Um, Yeah, and we can keep going on this. Thank you so much. It's fascinating. It's a whole history (laughs) lesson of everything that's going on. Um, So, Boyd, picking up to um, closer to now and practices, I guess the question to kick it off is, how have the Forest Service and the community addressed the health of the forest, both before, during, and after? Sure. Uh, Glad to. Glad to take a shot at that. I do have some slides as well. 
Yeah, my name is Boyd Labita. I'm a district forester with Colorado State Forest Service. Uh, I've been with the State Forest Service about 24 years. I've been here at Fort Collins as district forester about 10. I've been involved in wildfire uh, for most of my career, uh, various operational kind of roles, um, yet uh, forester is my day job and my job title. So I've gotten uh, kind of an interesting perspective on on both of those and how they influence each other. And uh, just in terms of my participation in fire, I'm, I'm currently a uh, fire behavior analyst, uh, which is a fancy way of saying I try to guess what the fire is going to do on a given day. Uh, really hard job, but but a fascinating one uh, as well. So anyways, um, so my talk is really about uh, what we do as an agency, the Colorado State Forest Service. We attempt to help people understand what they're getting into and what they're facing when they own forested land. Um, so and that's in our county is another fascinating part of Larimer County because there's uh, really a lot of landowners that own forested land. So uh, our job is to just help them figure out what's going on, what the ecology is, uh, what kind of meaningful intervention activities they might do uh, to, to improve some outcomes. So, um, yeah, that's our job. What I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, some work we've done at Lori State Park and uh, just kind of in response to that. So Lori described very well what, what the condition is in this lower ecotone. So, um, so we, we've come to the conclusion that, yeah, this fire regime has been interrupted in this lower ecotone. We have, we've got a different forest than we think historically was there and functioned under, under that, that regime. It's, it's different now. Um, but um, just a quick little snapshot of what we have there is that ponderosa pine, uh, you know, this is in Lori State Park, kind of in that back country, so probably about 6,500 feet, kind of those rolling ridges up there, steep slopes that drop down to the canyon, and of course the vegetation changes as you drop, and as you get onto south-facing slopes, our south-facing slopes are much drier, or tend to be brushier and juniper, north-facing slopes tend to be heavy conifer with a little bit of Douglas fir in there. Um, we did have some forest health uh, things going on there. Dwarf mistletoe is a, is a parasitic plant that grows on pine trees, uh, can affect how they grow up and just how long they live and, and their appearance and how they do. And that is obviously present in Lori. Uh, mountain pine beetle uh, is a factor, although um, I would not call it the heavy epidemic like we were seeing up higher elevations in lodgepole pine, but definitely uh, present down there. So the key things about this site we were looking at is fire had been excluded for a really long time um, because of the grazing and because of just being close to town and people putting fires out. Uh, so when that happens in these lower ecotone, we get a lot more conifer regeneration and trees make it. Trees that are germinated from seed make it and become bigger trees. So in, in a short period of time, a few decades we get to see a little picture of what Lori described happened over centuries of uh, trees becoming established there. So we've got this probably overstocked forest. Uh, we've got ladder fuels. We've got a lot of fuel. There's more fuel there than there would have been otherwise. Um, it gets better, though. Um, we're right in the middle of the wildland urban interface. So which means we've, in time, we've, we've got things out there. We've, we've developed that land. Uh, we've got cabins. We've got ranches. We've got state parks. We've got mountain subdivisions. Uh, we've got infrastructure related to power and water. Uh, just a lot of things that are not designed to be uh, have their process interrupted by periodic wildfire. So it's not a good um, uh, trajectory for both of those things because we're, we're saving up fuels because we don't let it burn, and then we have exposures out there that we've got to uh, address when that comes. And that, that's, you know, we got to see that. We all got to live that, in fact, during the High Park fire. Uh, we attempt, though, and we've worked hard over a long time. We didn't, this didn't surprise us. We knew this kind of condition existed. We've been working a really long time uh, to do forestry treatments that we think are going to reduce some of those outcomes and maybe even affect what happens during the event. Uh, in fact, Wrist Canyon is, is really the cradle, one of the cradles in Colorado of private land forest management. There's landowners and history of landowners doing forestry work 
uh, for a really long time. So it's not not a brand new concept, and people have been working at it for some time. Uh, our more recent way to try to organize to do that as communities is through a community wildfire protection plan. That's what the CWPP acronym is, and it's just a way to try to get uh, the community on the same page and, and in a conversation and uh, so that actions can complement each other and we can end up improving that uh, condition over time. So the High Park Fire, you probably have seen the progression map. Um, the blue colors are the earlier days of the fire and the more towards red or later days of the fire. Uh, it's a good description of just, it was unusual for us to have that many days in a row of really bad fire conditions where fire advanced on each of those days. Um, most of our experience at work in wildfires in the Rocky Mountains over the last few decades has been there's been one and maybe two days of significant fire advance. Then the weather changes and we put a line around it and it's held there. Uh, not so with High Park. Uh, just many days in a row, very dry and uh, just so much perimeter at that point. Even when there was calmer days, it continued to advance which uh, I'll make a point later about, but that was significant in firefighter effectiveness because uh, not every acre that burned up there, just like Lori described, was a crown fire. Lots of surface fire, lots of successful actions firefighters were able to take uh, during the fire. Um, so, wow. But yet, so we can look at this map and know that you know, on the science side and uh, just the appreciation of a natural phenomena that it's epic, you know, real epic fire from it to move near Buckhorn Canyon uh, to the mouth of Wrist Canyon in a 24 hour period is just uh, troubling, uh, astounding. I, if I would have made that up for a scenario we would have done for a training, it would have been ridiculous to, to do that. Why would we train for that? And it's not going to happen, but yet it did. And so yet this is, this is a big scale event and it's a really remarkable phenomenon, but it, all, it represents real loss. Uh, you know, there's really people that live there and have their homes there. And uh, so that for me, that's tempered, tempered the appreciation of the natural phenomena is just knowing uh, what, what has happened there uh, to a lot of people's land. Uh, so we attempt to intervene. So we, we attempt to do some management and do some forestry treatment that we think is going to improve the outcome. And what expectation we have going into that means something. So especially in looking at conditions like uh, the High Park Fire, that extreme conditions, very hot, hot days, uh, single digit humidity and winds in the 20s and 30 miles an hour in the summer, kind of like winds we would expect now when we have the downsloping Chinook winds in the wintertime. That's, we expect it now, but for it to happen in June is, is another different phenomenon. So uh, really remarkable conditions. So how can we expect a forestry treatment to perform under that kind of condition? And uh, the answer is, if we go in thinking, if I'm going to do a, a, a fuel break or a thinning on this property to stop the fire, that's not the case, uh, especially in, in, a, in a conditions like the Harpark Park Fire. So as far as stopping it, maybe even slowing it, we might not be able to do just because of these high winds and other, other things that we take. And preventing fires is not happening either. When the, whole, when the whole area gets dry, it's all dry and it's all susceptible to ignition. But... There are some benefits uh, to doing these different kinds of treatments. We can reduce some of the intensity. If we've done some activities to rearrange fuels and ideally reduce some of that tree cover, some of that woody loading, when it does burn, we've got a little less heat that was released up and down, importantly down. If we can protect soil and have a little less soil damage, uh, we have a little less erosion and uh, we have better uh, outcomes with our water quality. So that w that's called the burn severity. So how badly our soil is damaged is the burn severity. We think we can reduce that in some of those cases. Uh, there was a bunch of cases of improved uh, opportunities for firefighters to do some actions in there. So even a relatively small forestry treatment uh, in, the, in the right setting of wind and tactical operations gave firefighters opportunities to do things like burnout operations that, that succeeded. Uh, because of some of the forestry treatments that have been done. Uh, there's many places that probably did keep fire out of the canopy 
uh, instead of a crown fire. And I believe I'll show you one here in a minute with the Lori State Park photo series and, and probably a little then correspondingly a little less mortality in that overstory. So go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So we're going to talk about Lori State Park, which is the very, very southeast corner of the High Park Fire, real tiny uh, percentage of it, but yet uh, we've got, got some activity there. So that's an important little basin right there, Horsetooth Reservoir. That's where water from the Colorado Big Thompson Project is deposited. Uh, it's got a relatively small watershed that drains into it, and we know those as Horsetooth Mountain Park and Lori State Park. And we've been working a long time, uh, at least in terms modern, recent times, at doing different forestry treatments because we recognize this interrupted fire regime in this lower ecotone. So we've been working on doing treatments. So the, the pink and blue uh, uh, polygons you see up there are different forestry activities that have happened up there over time. Uh, generally, some kind of a thinning operation. Uh, quite a bit of it has been stacked, um, uh, slashed, all the limbs and tops, and burned. Uh, there's been some places, though, where it was just uh, chipped up, masticated, and, and left on the site. And all in efforts to just reduce those impacts, because that water all flows right into Horsetooth Reservoir. Uh, you can see the big red blob is the High Park Fire, where it burned through. So you can see through on that very north end, it burned through some of the units we had thinned uh, back in 2009. And uh, so we've got some photo points that, we, that I'll show you. But yet, so, so fire that arrived at that point um, wasn't necessarily the big push on the Saturday that the fire made its big move, uh, but yet on Sunday as it was moving back up Soldier Canyon. So it had burned down near the... Uh, the visitor center, so to speak, of, of Lower East State Park and then burned back up the hill under less windy, uh, less uh, extreme conditions, but nonetheless a uh, significant advance of fire there. So this is uh, a picture of before treatment. So this is what we, we recognized as this lower montane ecotone that has got this interrupted fire regime. You see a lot of trees. You see not the sun's not reaching the ground. We're going to be starting to shade out. And when, when regenerating ponderosa pine gets shaded out, they're not healthy. They're not doing well. Uh, they're overcrowded, but they don't die very fast when that happens. So they hang in there a long time. So we've got a fairly thick forest condition. We also have, though, um, still a perennial grass cover in there. So it hadn't gone to the point of being a completely uh, just a pine needle understory uh, we still had that that grass cover so i would like you to focus on the let's see your right so there's trunks of three bigger trees there uh, so stay focused on those I don't, okay all right that one that one and that one we're going to be kind of just referencing those as we look at later treatments we're going to be zooming out a little bit though in these treatments or in these photos so, so there's our forest. So we do have this component of uh, uh, bigger trees that are not really old. Uh, you know, they're probably somewhere between 80 and 120 years old, the biggest ones there. And then, of course, the smaller trees are all going to be younger, younger ages as we go through. So just keep that visual in mind, um, what this forest looks like. So go ahead and go to the next slide. And so there's, there's our three trees. Uh, in there. So we've zoomed out a little bit, but we did this uh, forestry treatment to try to move this forest to a more, um, uh, more resilient in terms of what its, its fire regime function might have been. We didn't burn it, of course. It was just a forest thinning project, but we did try to open it up. You know, this ponderosa pine forest, uh, based on research people like Lori are doing, we, we recognize ponderosa as being a little more group you know, clumps of trees and mini meadows and bigger meadows and not a closed canopy forest. So this is what we were trying to achieve. Uh, so that was in 2009. I think the thinning was actually done in, in 08 that winter. So this was probably the first season of, of growth after that. So you can see there's a perennial grass cover. It was already starting to come back in. Uh, we did have uh, some residual fuel on the ground from the, from the thinning. We weren't able to extract... Uh, you know, harvest uh, wood like we would normally like to. So we had to just decide to to do the thinning and uh, 
and go with that. So, so that was 2009. And so here's a picture in August of 2012, which was probably about two months after it burned in the High Park fire. So fire came at this particular place from the right. So our three trees are over here. There's our three trees that were in that original photo. It came, fire came from that side as a surface fire. Um, so fire was not moving crown to crown. Uh, it was on the ground. However, uh, one of the, the, the consequences or the cost we had of that was that we had some material on the ground still. You know, we had thinned it and left material on the ground. It burned fairly hot because it was dry, of course, and we got a fair amount of scorch, which is going to happen in any any burn, any surface fire, uh, but we probably had a little bit higher of, of uh, scorch height on those trees that would make it otherwise uh, through the fire. But you can see some some good things going on in spite of how dry it was and how problematic uh, things happened during the fire and then even more so after the fire as then, of course, weeks later it rained. These were even after those uh, thunderstorms we got in July of that year. And if you recall, that is when the pooter went black and we started drinking the Colorado Big Thompson water out of Horsetooth Reservoir and letting the pooter all uh, pass through. So, so we're seeing grass regenerate already in there and that's good and that's helping hold our soil i realize there's a lot of other places in the fire area that that was not happening this is just uh, one i happened to pick so you can see some live trees in there so there's one that is alive it's got a pretty good canopy probably make it and then in the background uh, you can see a, another uh, set of trees uh, across what we kind of opened up a, a pre-existing natural meadow in there when we did the thinning <coughs> So, uh, September 13, so this was a year later, uh, 2013 was a very good growing year. I mean, if you recall, uh, we had good spring moisture, we had uh, periodic summer rains, good growing season. You can see the vegetative cover is uh, taking advantage of that, doing great. We've got good grass coming in. Uh, we do, do though see some of the stand continue to die. Uh, so trees that were heavily scorched and uh, maybe had just a little green at the top. Um, we do have some uh, rules of thumb and guidelines for that, and uh, we expect some of those to die, and that's, that is what happened in there. But you can see uh, grass coming on nicely, and go ahead and roll to the next one. And there's this September, uh, this past September, uh, we see more trees continue to die out, but yet uh, the trees that are making it are looking better overall they've they've had two good growing seasons now and they have less competition with other trees uh, they've put on good candle growth um, nice response from the trees that are going to make it this is probably a little more like the fire regime that the lower ecotone uh, was uh, uh, in in those times so um, I'm not trying to take credit for being all brilliant that we uh, knew this was coming and we knew it was going to turn out like this it's just a pretty good little example of where we, we did attempt to intervene, uh, had some setbacks, but some success, and certainly a lot that we could learn uh, from what we experienced there. So, Thank you, Boyd. Kind of gone from evolutionary to closer, and um, what was the, I'm just going to try to remember this term, interrupted fire pattern? It sounded better than that. What was the it? The fire regime. Fire so, regime. Yeah, Lori described the natural fire regime. So that lower ecotone was like seven to fifteen year fire return interval based on the tree ring right. data. And then so, but the this site didn't have that. So it probably been a century since this place since burned. Since that one went. But I don't know. If, I don't know that for a fact. But a long time. It's been a long time. Well, and so now we're gonna move on down the table here to Tony <laughs> to kind of talk about. We've seen what happens on its own. We've seen what happens when we um, interrupt that. And so how do we move forward in, in creating policy and, and, and our actions moving forward? Uh, just, a, just a by way of introduction, a good evening. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, my name is Tony Chang. I'm a professor in the Forest uh, and Rangeland Stewardship Department. It's an academic 
program at Colorado State University, and I also, as part of uh, within the academic program, direct something called the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute, which really serves as a bridge between the the research and education that we do around around things like forest and fire ecology and management, and actually bring it out into the field. And so we have projects that. Uh, we work with land managers, both on public land and non uh, non federal land, um, and and a lot of that is through a variety of these community uh, approaches. A lot of stakeholders getting together to try to address some of these issues that uh, Boyd and uh, talked about. Um, and I also help manage a, another center. Uh, it's called the it's a new center uh, of the to manage the wildland urban interface fire risk because of these. Um, kind of new normal events that we unfortunately are experiencing in Colorado. Obviously, High Park is our uh, local event, but we have long histories of that now going back about 20 years. But we have Waldo Canyon and Black Forest, and we are likely to uh, probably see more of those. And those of you that are weather geeks, um, remember how warm and dry it was in March of 2012? Doesn't it feel kind of the same way? Um, so, so this is this is something that we we understand is just not it's it's not just an anomalous thing. Um, so I I uh, I agree I agreed not to put together a a big slide presentation, um, and so I I was going to take some things on the fly, and uh, for once in in a long time I've run out of things to say, <laughs> but. Uh, but I so but I, I do have some fallback. So uh, Terry, if you can go to slide three on my things, and I, I just want to see how this shows up. So this is this is a map that's very similar to what Boyd uh, showed, and I want to kind of walk you through it because it also touches on what Lori Lori was talking about. So this is the High Park fire footprint. Here's Horse Tooth, sorry Horse Tooth Reservoir down here. Um, this is a uh, wrist. No, this is the Poudre Canyon. Risk Canyon Road would be up here. Yes, you guys are much more, uh, you guys probably dream about this uh, in your sleep, this map. This map is, uh, is basically a product of satellite imagery. And what it does, it's, it's called a burn um, uh, area reflectancy kind of composite. And what it does is it, uh, it looks at, it compares the reflectance of infrared before uh, all the foliage was gone and then after, and, and it calculates this difference. And so, um, as all maps like these are, the, the red is the greater the difference and the more that was burned. Okay. Lori was talking about how in higher elevations in um, where, where forests are characteristically burned with high severity, which means that all of the foliage and all of the, the trees essentially die, or, or at least the greenness gets burned off. Um, this right here is, is uh, East White Pine Mountain, and this is West White Pine Mountain. And this is the, this is the South uh, Fork of the Pooter and, and Pingree Park Road, so if you can orient yourself around there. Uh, and so those are pretty big red patches of pretty high, large patches of high mortality, almost 100% of the trees, like the picture that uh, Lori showed. Down here lower in the lower elevation, uh, which is kind of in that lower ecotone that we've been talking about, we would expect to see much more sort of green, yellowish. But what Lori was saying is that what we, we're surprisingly seeing is stand replacing fire where we probably should see surface fire. Um, and so this is a this is a pattern that we see uh, that we we saw on the High Park. It's also a pattern that we saw on the Big Elk Fire, on the Overland Fire, on the North the the um, the Four Mile, uh, Waldo Canyon. You, you right? You just we just go the down the list of all the major fires that we've had on the Colorado Front Range, and we see this pattern, which is abnormal. And and it also happens to be where we have a lot of um, mountain subdivisions. Um, uh, p places where, 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 where people live. This, is, this, is, this whole area, I believe, is the Whale Rock subdivision. And uh, next, the, our next um, panel we'll talk about, uh, we'll make some presentations on, on the, the amount of uh, high severity fire that resulted in a high rate of home loss. Um, so th these are all just kind of context. The other thing that I'll also note is that up here is the old, uh, is the Hewlett 
Gulch fire that burned about a week before the High Park fire. And, um, and, um, and even before that, those of you who have a longer memory, there was the Picnic Rock fire that burned right about from here up into the, up into the east side of that. And so um, now that the fire that burned in 2012 was actually one of those cooler surface fires just because you didn't have a lot of that uh, tree canopy and those kinds of things. So this whole area now, we, we, we were experiencing, for better or for worse, we were, retur- we, were re- we were returning to a fire interval of 7 to 15 years. Um, the policy question then becomes, well, um, because of all of the infrastructure and the people that we have here, um, it's, it's, it's not acceptable to let fires burn in all places at all times. So what we if we if you go back to the first slide please Terry um, this is uh, this is kind of this is a national uh, this is national level data I don't have the specifics here for Larimer County uh, but the the red uh, up and down lines are is the uh, number the size and number of acres burned on any given year uh, as you go back to uh, to the 1960s and um, uh, so we, we kind of bounce around, but kind of an average uh, fire, uh, number of fires and size of fires uh, kind of bounces around, oh, 4 million acres a year. And then starting in the 2000s, when we started seeing uh, some more drought, some pretty intense drought in, in 2000, 2002, but continuing in terms of this upward trend, now we're seeing fire, uh, um, total acres burned in the U.S., uh, uh, up to 10 million acres, so more than doubling the size of fires, the, the total acreage of fires. Um, and then on the right hand here is the cost of fighting those. These are, these, this is just fire suppression costs. It doesn't count any other costs like recovery and rebuilding and all the, this is just money that goes to put young men and women in, in yellow shirts and green pants and engines and planes and helicopters in the air. And this is the blue line. And so prior to the 2000s, it's kind of bounced around between 200 and $500 million. And after 2000, uh, there hasn't been a year that's less than $1 billion. And that's not expected to go back down either. And so what, we, what we're seeing is um, size of fires, the total acres of fires uh, that are burning are going up, and therefore the suppression costs are going up. The only thing that is going down, and I didn't be able, wasn't able to graph it on this, is the number of fires. So the number of fires is going down, but the size, the average size of the fires is going up. And what this, what this, what we can interpret this is, we are really effective in this blue line at putting out about 98 percent of all fire starts. And, and that includes the ones here in northern Colorado. So just imagine, it's the 2% that get to be those big fires. 2% of the fires that are, ignite end up being the high parks, the Waldo Canyons. And those are the ones where we have, that's where we're focusing a lot of these resources. And so the, the, the policy shift that we're seeing in terms of fire suppression uh, is still very, it really hasn't changed, um, even though we might understand that fire suppression is a negative thing in terms of allowing fuels to build up. But the irony is that the fires that do start, we, 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 we have to put out because we risk the danger of them turning into things like High Park. But there are conditions where the 2% turn into the High Park. And so we, we get into what's called a fire suppression cycle where the more energy we put into suppressing fire, the more we are pushing that solar energy that Lori was talking about. The, 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 if you think about what a fire is, it's the release of all that photosynthetic energy that's been built up over 80 to 100 years in a tree, multiplied by the tens of thousands of trees, right? Solar energy one of the most powerful things that we can imagine. And once it gets out of that, that first burn period, you can see how much energy is waiting to be released within that first 36 hours. And it was phenomenal, the phenomenal rate of growth. And then at that point, you can't suppress the fire. 
the winds are too high, you can't put planes, it's unsafe to put people, and those are the fires that get away. And so we, we, we get, we've gotten, in a national policy sense, in this loop, this vicious loop that we can't get out of. So that's sort of one oh, bummer kind of <laughs> kind of thing. And, and um, so we, we focus on the things that we can control. And the thing that we can control is exactly what Boyd has done up at Lori and is working with other landowners uh, to do, which is to reduce the woody fuels and, and to create a, 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 an environment where when the fire comes, it's not if, but when the fire comes, it's going gonna, it's gonna to burn through these areas with less intensity. It's going to hopefully leave a lot of trees alive to provide seed source, and it's going to reduce the impacts to things like watersheds and those kinds of things. But the other issue is that those are also fires that can still burn down homes. Right. Uh, there, there's been a cumulative set of studies that have been done um, uh, looking at fires uh, and, and home loss in from Southern California to Texas. Um, and uh, the general, you know, don't quote me on the statistics, but the vast majority, maybe maybe a three quarters of the homes that are lost in those fires are a result from embers and surface fire. It's not, the, it's not the big raging crown fire that's burning down homes. It's the surface fire long bef- and, and the embers long before the fire front uh, hits. And so, um, so then we ha- we're still putting out fires even if they're surface fires. And so we, that, that contributes to that, that vicious loop. Um, but uh, the good news is that is that uh, the, the these fires and the recognition that we've we've altered these forests uh, have spurred a lot of, a lot of coordination and cooperation and collaboration among local, state, and federal agencies, among communities and homeowners. Um, and my my la- my only other slide that I'll show, if you can advance it, Terry, is to. Uh, highlight that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of this effort is coordinated through what's called the Front Range Roundtable, and it's composed of about uh, 60 different organizations um, from your federal federal agencies like the U.S. Forest Service, the National Park Service, uh, the State Forest Service, and other state agencies are involved, and a whole bunch of local government um, uh, and, and community representatives. My institute is involved, other university uh, organizations are involved to really try to uh, coordinate our efforts to get a program of reducing those woody fuels and doing that mechanical work uh, that Boyd was talking about. Um, the, so this, this was a, a recommendation from this body back in 2006. Um, there was a, there's a new policy that was uh, enacted in 2010 that created basically a, a, a funding source for implementing these kinds of uh, forest restoration fuel reduction projects uh, all, all across the country. And we here on the Front Range got one of the first, um, well, we don't call it a grant, but it was, it was awarded this, uh, the first program. And about a million and a half dollars comes every year. It's matched by other sources uh, to, to get all this work done on the ground. And so that's that's a very positive thing, and one of the one of our uh, hopes is that that the fi- when the fires do burn, they at least don't become these big canopy fires. That they do stay on the surface, and when they stay on the surface, uh, firefighters have a better chance of um, of managing those. Uh, but as uh, Boyd was talking about, one of the issues that we have is uh, a lot of the trees that we're we want to we want to remove don't have any economic value. So if we were in places like California or Oregon, where trees get a little bigger, they grow a little straighter, there's an industry to use them, um, the industry would actually buy those, and it helps the economics of doing this kind of work. In Colorado, we don't have either of those. And so what, uh, what we end up having is somewhere, uh, I would, I'm just going to shoot ballpark, Boyd, about $1,000 an acre on average to do this kind of work, depending on... That's probably pretty good. Pretty good average, some higher, some lower. This document identified 400,000 acres of needing this kind of work. I'm I'm not really good at math, but I do know this math, and that'd be $400 million 
just to do this kind of work on the front range. Right? There, we're, that ain't going to happen. Right? We just we and, and and in part because all of the money is going to that blue line. That's going up, and so we're so we're we're managing fire in some way. We're just we're just managing it on the back end of the fire rather than on the front end of doing things that that Boyd is doing, and so that's kind of where where we're at. That the that there's there's a recognition, there's funding, but it's we're we're still caught in the suppression cycle. So this just fascinating. I'm so glad I'm here. I'm learning a ton. <clears throat> um, again, if you have questions, please send them up. I'm gonna. <clears throat> shoot one out here and uh, all of you speak to it but um 400 million acres that doesn't even address how many different potential land owners and property owners within that level um <clears throat> so i'm curious from all of your perspectives because you know the area well you've been out there you're researching it you're seeing it what have you seen over time whether it's just this fire or fires over history what is the most effective mitigation, if there is such a thing? Because fire is also unpredictable. Because, I mean, I'm just sort of guessing here. I, I didn't live in the fire area. But, you know, individuals individually kind of need to be aware. As a community, need to be aware. As the larger community, you know, you just keep taking it up until you get to that national level. But So my question, bringing it down, what can individuals do? What mitigation is most beneficial if there is such a thing? Any and all. Well, I can tell you what's the most beneficial, but it's not really something that individuals can do. Um, this landscape has <coughs> been, as it is, for at least the last 5,000 years, adapting to climate changes. The vegetation moves up and down the elevational gradient and takes the fire regimes with it, um, usually with a lag climate will change and then it takes a hundred or two hundred years for the vegetation to completely switch over to what is more appropriate to the new climate. So here we are in a period of unprecedented climate change. Looks like we're headed towards something very much like the medieval warm period and then possibly beyond to something with no analog that we know of. Um, you know, what happened historically was that the vegetation adapted over a period of time. There were people here, um, and they adapted too. They were nomadic, um, largely because there wasn't a whole lot of water. You couldn't predictably try to plant crops or irrigate, so they followed the herds, they followed the water, and they were very adaptable. Um, the other thing that happened as a result of these natural fire regimes is it created what we call a mosaic of vegetation across the landscape. So if you stand up on top of a hill and you look out as far as you can see, it's not just a carpet of one type of vegetation, particularly as you're looking like up or down a slope. You'll see some younger trees over here, some older trees over there, some aspen here, some open ground here, maybe grass. Some of that is the legacy of topography. Some of it is the legacy of past disturbance. And so Tony was mentioning that area up by Hewlett Gulch where there have been multiple fires in the last, I guess, 15, 20 years that's beginning to create a more natural fire regime. You have that mosaic of vegetation, and that mosaic then creates natural fuel breaks. You get a fire, and for the next... 20 years, the area that burned in that fire is going to have a different fuel structure. So it'll act as a fuel break, or at the very least, uh, will slow down a hotter fire. Um, and one piece of information I wanted to share with you guys when, when Boyd was talking about how intense the conditions were in the High Park fire, which is day after day of, of wind, and it was so hot and it was so dry. I have data from the last thousand years of fire history on both sides of the Poudre Canyon. In the last thousand years, I have only six fire dates that I find on both sides of the canyon. Now, with the techniques that we have, we really can't draw historical fire maps. We just know that there was fire in a place that scarred a tree. But that's six fires in a thousand years that burned under conditions that were probably as extreme as the High Park. So that's some pretty extreme climatic conditions. And 
didn't happen too often historically. So I guess my to sum up my answer to your question would be that we need to adapt a little bit to the fact that we've got a changing climate and that the vegetation is going to adapt to the changing climate and maybe allow some of these fires that get started under less extreme conditions to do what they're going to do and recreate that vegetation mosaic. Terry, can you go to Boyd's presentation? Sorry to mess with you, but uh, and and go to slide number four. So what Boyd what Boyd had uh, talked about, um, and I and I really like this is uh, he 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 he. If you recall, there were things that had uh, um, uh, marginal success in affecting the fire. Uh, the things that had marginal effect was stopping the fire, slowing the fire, or preventing fire. One of the, I think one of the one of the um, assumptions, the goals of our current fire policy is to do all three. Fire prevention, fire control. I mean, we, we have names of agencies that, that, that use those terms, fire prevention and control, and yet the kinds of fires that we experience in these, these, these systems, uh, even in doing these kinds of fuel mitigation, uh, those become pretty unrealistic goals. And so I want to direct your attention to that, that uh, many of our goals are organized around, around your, those, those three points on the left. And, we, and we've created some very unrealistic expectations about what, our, what the goals of, of our fire and fuel management programs are meant to do. Um, I, I, I have a former student who now happens to be the branch chief for fire and aviation of the U.S. Forest Service. And he told me um, um, uh, at a meeting that he, uh, you know, he, the buck stops with him. He's the one that deploys massive amounts. He's the one that is that is responsible for the blue line going up. He makes. He's the one that authorizes the expenditures. And he said that he th that he is the funnel point for unrealistic political and cultural expectations of what we how we deal with fire. And you know he doesn't get paid enough to deal with that, but it's it, it's a, it's an entire right it's entire sort of social cultural political expectation of what our goals are, and even though we've we we've, we've come to the recognition, and and um, you know among the science and management community and even among the public is recognizing that these are fire driven ecosystems our policies and our cultural expectations have not caught up to these to these changes. And it, it's probably more realistic to have goals like those on the right side. That when we do mitigation, what we're really mitigating are these things. We may not, and, and even when we do all these things, keeping fire, the canopy, and all these kinds, we, we're still not creating a condition where homes won't burn. There's no guarantee. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of you might be familiar with FireWise and, and those kinds of programs that, that have certain um, recommendations and those kinds of things. Um, the, the, the honest to goodness truth is we don't have probably hardly any science to, to back up where those standards come from. We don't know how homes burn in a, in a wildland fire. We, all those are based on experiments that were in a lab, and and that's fine. We got to we got to go with something. But we're we're well. The if there's any uh, benefit of having a lot of these recent fires is that we are now learning about how homes burn. But that's uh, I I would be willing to um, you know give up that experiment, right? To to not learn about that anymore if we were if if we had a choice. So that's sort of one is that this notion of Mitigation got to be realistic about what we even expect as a goal. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. That was very good, very good, both of you guys. Um, so I can, I'm, I'm, to my mind, it's coming. It's a couple of different uh, uh, ways to look at this, and one of them would be the forest structure. You know, what kind of forest uh, is resilient and is uh, mitigated? And uh, I think we we've identified a place we can go look at that, and that's Gateway Park. Um, in the Poudre Canyon. So that burned in the Picnic Rock fire, uh, parts of it burned in the Hewlett fire, and it all burned 
in High Park Fire. So, uh, and what you're going to see there is really widely spaced uh, groups of ponderosa pine and a grassy, brushy place. So for the lower ecotone, um, that's that that's good. That's what it looks like. That's a resilient, uh, resilient in terms of fire. Uh, uh, whether you can get that done on your property or not is is a different a different question and a much more challenging one. Uh, but that's that's kind of one thing it looks like. Uh, related to protection activities, um, protecting a home or uh, infrastructure or whatever, uh, Tony nailed it. There's no guarantee, but there is a, a effort, and there's there's standards, there's things we we know uh, help. Uh, there, so if we can think back to April of 2011, uh, the Crystal Fire burned up in um, Crystal Mountain uh, down towards the Buckhorn. Um, April. Um, that was a huge snow year, if you remember. It, we had tremendous snow and tremendous runoff. Uh, all the snow fell above 8,000 feet, and below 8,000 feet, it was dry down here, and that's exactly where the fire got going and established. So yet, and the, the conditions that that fire burned under were um, nighttime, 70-mile-an-hour uh, downsloping winds. And so the homes, there was 11 homes burned in the Crystal Fire, and they all had fantastic defensible space. Um, in fact, some of them didn't even need defensible space because they were out in the open. And uh, so yet wind and embers and the variability in structures is a, it creates a vulnerability. You just, if there's just, with a house, there's just so many little crevices and little, oh, just little places that embers could get blown into or just something as simple as where the firewood is stacked and embers blow into the firewood. Uh, we lost a home on the Reservoir Road fire because of that. Firefighters had even checked the place. Embers had been in the firewood pile and the firefighters were there, checked it, hung out for a while, left. Firewood gets going, the house is lost. And so it's the, the, the science I see being really challenging to figure out you know, here it is. Here's the template. Here's the pattern. What it looks like. It's, there's just so much variability in that environment, the n natural environment, and then the environment of the home and the the characteristics of the home that make it going. So, so what I would uh, say though is, um, it's it's a good approach to do your best on your property and do the best defensible space you can do. Uh, be diligent about maintaining it, uh, and yet hold on loosely you know um because there's no guarantees and you can we've had that over and over i think tony simon said that in the first meeting there's people who did everything we asked them to and still lost their home and that uh, you know that's, that's terrible I, I feel terrible about that but we're in an environment we're in an ecosystem that's alive and functioning and it's going to do its thing and uh so uh we just got to. that's that's the adjustment i see we need to make is uh you know be stewards and and do the best we can and that's good and and we can have peace with that but just know that uh it's it's a it's a no living guarantees. thing yeah um i do have two questions here um one is what is the time frame for soils to come back especially after those super intense burns Anyone? Um, well, uh, so there was a big range, of course, big range of uh, soil effect in the in the fire. The one that we know about the most and gets the most attention would be the real severe burning, the hydrophobic soil. So where there was heavy fuel loading, uh, intense fire, and that lasted a while on a site. So it changes this the sto soil structure and soil chemistry. Uh, creates that waxy hydrophobic layer, uh, the little seal uh, that causes water to not soak in like a sponge, but to run hard. And when it starts moving with, with speed, it starts to pick up material and move it down. Um, so maybe somebody knows better, but I think it's a couple of years worth of that effect. So even if it doesn't have rain break it down, just over those two seasons or so, uh, just sun action and plant action and, and other uh, physical processes start to break that down. Yeah, fr freezing and thawing will 
break break apart. And and so, um, uh, I'm more familiar with with hydrophobicity up in up in some of the fires up in the higher country up in the lodgepole. And those are because there's there's more dramatic freezing and thawing, but um, it's about two to three years. Um, and so that you know, and and so if that's one of the properties of allowing you know, water to, to soak through. Another property is how long is it going to take for vegetation to come back? And that's, that's a really common question, and that's a really big concern right after the fire, which is why you see helicopters dumping, you know, mulch and hay and, and, and seed um, to, to try to just get some stuff established to stabilize those so they don't slide in. Um, in uh, in uh, there's the 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 Hayman fire which burned in 2002 that was a huge fire, and there was a lot of high severity. Uh, one of Lori's colleague uh, Paula Fornwalt has done uh, some plant uh, establishment studies, and um, actually in the highest severity burn severity, uh, she actually found probably more uh, native plant diversity coming back. So, so soil, you know, there, there's lots of seed that's still left in the soil. It, it did take a while to come back. I think uh, the first three or four years, there's hardly anything and really started seeing uh, bursts around, around four, four, five, and six. But now, uh, 12 years, uh, my math is horrible. 10 years? No. 12 years. Yeah, it's a long day. This is my third. This is my third presentation of the day. So I am on my last legs. Um, uh, it's uh, the 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 plant diversity is the same as it was prior to the fire. So a, a comment on that. Um, I studied fire science in college as in my master's program, and there were a lot of fire adapted plants that I had heard about but had never seen. One of them was this plant called Golden Smoke. It has pretty yellow flowers. You guys are probably seeing it up in the High Park now. I had never seen it until 2000 when the Bobcat Gulch fire burned, and we went in there to do some studies for the next couple years after, and it was everywhere. It had been nowhere to be seen for 100 years, and it hung out the seeds, tiny little, teeny little black seeds that you have to really look at close to see them, hung out in the top couple of inches of the soil just waiting for the next fire to create the right circumstances for it to bloom and do its thing. And within five years, it was gone. Wow. OK, I'm going to need some help with this one. The question is around um, some, what is it? A comment. Okay, I was going to ask the question one, um, which is about, and I'm sorry I can't read, what type of fire versus managed fire and how front range policy might be different than national policy. Natural, natural, fire, versus managed. natural fire versus managed fire. And and how is that different, if at all, or should it be from front range versus national policy? Um. So I think I think I want to get the terminology right. That there that um, are you are you referring to managed fire as something that would be like a prescribed fire or a fire that starts naturally and then is allowed to burn? Yeah. The, the so the latter. Yeah, the difference between the two. Okay. Well, they're the uh, uh, I think they're they're just sort of along a continuum. So a, a managed fire is a fire that was natural that ignited naturally, but um, was allowed to burn under certain management circumstances, and uh, I I would uh, I'm I'm going to make a assumption that that is not a reality on the front range. That that because because of what we see in the rapidity of the fire growth, even if it was ten miles way up around Pennock Pass, in 36 hours it's at the dairy, and so. Every fire start in in the in the front range from basically Larimer County down to Pueblo has a no matter where it starts it has a chance to become a a, a fire that's going to affect homes communities lives infrastructure and those kinds of things and the risk aversion of managers and policymakers who is going to make that call who's going to be the one that stands up and says you know what. This is actually the kind of fire condition that we want to allow to burn. And all it takes is one wind shift, 
and and they lose their jobs their their lives are horrible and no one's going to take that risk and so one of the one of the things that that has been discussed is um you know how do we you know if for the larger good both for communities and uh, human communities and natural communities that people are emboldened to take that even if something goes wrong can they be protected from the really bad because what happens is that becomes a personal liability the 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 organization they work for their their hands off it's a personal liability you get you as an individual as a fire off management officer incident commander it's you it's on you and you know that that's where you know that's where that, that so to hit the long story is it, it's hard to imagine a condition in the front range where we would have managed natural fire. Just this year, this this uh, fall, we are finally we are seeing some of the first prescribed fires, right? The the, the intentionally ignited fires uh, we've seen in four or five years, and uh, and a lot of that is because of the uh, the fallout as a result of the Lower North Fork fire. So there's just, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a scary thing. I, I can think of one uh, front range fire that uh, represents kind of a way these incident management teams uh, modify how they do that management. It was called the Cow Creek Fire, mm-hmm. Rocky Mountain National Park in 2010. Yeah. So it was a lightning, lightning ignited fire real high, yeah. way above yeah. Glen Haven, way up in the park. And they managed it because uh, it was you know, part of their fire management plan, and it was not threatening. And so the suppression actions they did, when it did make a move, uh, were on the Glen Haven side. So they did suppression actions on the eastern edge of the fire uh, in the park, uh, but the western um, and north, for that matter, uh, was all timberline above it, you know, Higgs Peak and all that. And it did burn, uh, did burn up the timberline. Oh yeah, like yeah, I think yeah. so. Fern and those Lake. those were probably the first two fires that were let to burn. Um, we don't use that term anymore since the Oozle fire in 1979, which was one of the first ones. It it was a lightning strike way up high near Upper Tree Line. It was in like October, and they thought, okay, this will be a perfect one to let go. Shouldn't be a problem. Burned for about a week. Everybody kind of forgot about it. And then one day the downsloping winds picked up and by the next afternoon it was threatening Allen's Park. And that was kind of the end of the, what was then called the let it burn policy became prescribed natural fire for 20 years in Rocky Mountain National Park. But I will say too that um, the kind of, of mitigation activities that Boyd does, where you're thinning out the small trees and the brush and you're trying to open up forests, that's all great in terms of fire break. But for the vegetation itself, which is adapted to fire, the effect is very different. You don't get your golden smoke coming back in areas that have just been mechanically cleared. Um, you don't get the refreshing of the shrubs by the above ground parts being killed and sprouting. You don't get the stimulation of the aspen to the degree that you would with a fire. So there are definitely ecologically beneficial things about fire that are superior to mechanical thinning. But as Tony says, we just have so many people scattered around the front range that it's very, very difficult to get a fire going and not burn somebody's house down. So our last comment here, I think, related to the soil. Um, some people had had situations where everything organic is gone, like they're just rocks and gravel left in that space. Will will soil come back? <laughs> yeah, it certainly will. Uh, <laughs> you know, the time scale that that will happen under is not maybe what we'd want or expect, but certainly will. That the land we're looking at has all burned before. And if it burned during the medieval dry period, it nuked it then. And so if, you know, it's, it will, it will recover. It just might not be what we think. And if we look at those, uh, those forest structures like Lori does through time, uh, we see places that are forested now uh, that were a result of ecological periods where it was real uh, favorable for growing trees on sites that were probably pretty marginal during the the dry period so um i think we'll see certainly vegetative recovery in time um 
but yet it might not be, uh, especially in that in that lower ecotone and even in the mixed conifer uh, where there was a lot of Douglas fir and ponderosa pine, those are the species that are not just going to snap back after fire. Like she described lodgepole doing, most of the shrub species sprout back beautifully, perennial plants sprout back. Uh, Ponderosa and Douglas fir uh, tend to have their seed source burned a little more readily and don't uh, reestablish as quickly. And if the fire's hot enough to totally scorch the soil, it's going to kill the seeds in the soil seed bank, like like your golden smoke. It may kill the roots of your mountain mahogany, and so you're going to have to wait for seeds to come in. But they will. You'll get a period of two or three wet years, and the seeds will eventually blow in or be brought in by birds or animals, and, and it will eventually come back, like Boyd says, just maybe not on our time schedule. Um, we are at about 7 o'clock. Um, one, I want to really thank everyone for coming. I want to thank the panelists. I also want to give you, if you have some 30-second wrap-up, if you didn't get to say something you want to say, if, and if not, that's fine, but... Um, one little check. If you do have questions, these guys will be here for a few minutes because you're blocking them and the exit. <laughs> <laughs> so you can always ask more questions in that regard. Um, and again, um, let's give a hand to these guys. <clears throat>